hey guys, here is a summary of the first topic for your AQA chemistry, um, atomic structure and the periodic table. I've tried to summarize everything in here as quickly as I can, but still covering everything. To go with this, you can go and get the free revision guide from my website, which goes through every single thing you need to know, and then links to a more detailed video about it. And then after you've done this video, you can check out the quick fire questions, also in the free revision guide to check that you remember everything. Good luck guys and don't forget I've done loads and loads of videos like this so subscribe so you don't miss any of those ones coming up. Fundamental to all studies of chemistry is an understanding of the periodic table. Now do not worry, you get given a periodic table, you do not have to learn it but you do have to learn how to use the periodic table. So what you need to know is that all substances are made from atoms um, and elements of these atoms can be found on the periodic table. So everything that is known to exist so far is listed on the periodic table. You can see these symbols here, the letters, and they tell us what things are. For example, my favourite one and really, really good for quizzes, this. The symbol W stands for tungsten. You need to know what an element of compounds and a mixture is. A compound is two or more different elements that are chemically bonded together. An element is something that can be found on the periodic table. A mixture is going to be two or more, but possibly lots of things that are all mixed together. So they could be chemically bonded, they could not be chemically bonded. There's not generally a pattern to it. Elements, pure things. Compounds, two or more different things, chemically bonded together. Mixture, lots of different things. Some of them chemically bonded, some of them not. Here we have the structure of the atom and we have electrons. These are on the shells around the outside. We have protons, which is in the nucleus in the middle, and we have neutrons, which are also in the nucleus in the middle. This bit here is the nucleus. And these are the shells, or energy levels. Now this picture here isn't drawn to scale. In reality, the nucleus is tiny and the electron shells fill up loads and loads of empty space. The mass of an electron is so small we say that it's zero and the mass of protons and neutrons are both one. The charge on an electron is minus one. The charge on a proton is plus one and the charge on a neutron is zero. When you look at your periodic table, you are going to see um, boxes that look like this. We are going to have our symbol in here. That is going to tell us what the element is. You're going to have the name of the element and there are going to be two numbers. Now, different examples are gonna have these numbers positioned in different places. It does not matter about the position. It matters which is the larger number. So the larger number is going to be the mass number. And the smaller number is the atomic number. Now the atomic number uh, tells us the number of protons something has and it is equal to the number of electrons in an atom. The mass number is equal to the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. 
for an atom, and this is important, this is how you work it out in an atom, the number of protons is equal to the atomic number, so that is 24. The number of electrons is equal to the atomic number, that is 24. And the number of neutrons is equal to the mass number, 52, minus the atomic number, 24, giving us 28 neutrons. Writing word equations from an experiment or from a block of text is a complicated skill and you need to practice it, but you're not gonna get anywhere unless you know your formula. So you have to learn these. Carbon dioxide is CO2, water is H2O, oxygen gas is O2, hydrogen gas is H2, nitrogen gas is N2, ammonia is NH2, three, hydrochloric acid is HCl, sulfuric acid is H2SO4. Now what they will generally give you is a um, situation in text and expect you to write the word equation and potentially the balance symbol equation for that. This is a complicated skill, the only thing you can do with this is practice. Nitrogen gas and hydrogen gas react together to form ammonia. Write the balance symbol equation for this. A sensible place to start with this is by writing out the word equation for what happens. So we've taken our long, complicated block of text and we've turned it into a slightly simpler word equation. So nitrogen gas, and these are the, some of the ones that you have to remember. Nitrogen gas is N2 plus hydrogen gas which is H2, goes into ammonia, which is NH3. To balance this, what we do is we draw circles around each of the things, draw a line down the middle, list what we have, nitrogen, hydrogen, nitrogen, hydrogen, and I know this one only has two things in it, but for longer things, try and keep them in the same order because it helps um, simplify things. Then we need to work out how many we have of each thing. So nitrogen, we have two. Hydrogen, we have two. On the other side, nitrogen, we have one. Hydrogen, we have three. So we need to increase the number of things we have on both sides. So I'm going to start with nitrogen, and the only thing that I can add is another bubble, and I cannot change what is inside the bubble, so it has to be a whole other bubble of NH3, which changes all of my numbers. I now have one, two nitrogens, and I have three, six hydrogens. So now you can see I have the same number of nitrogens on both sides, two on both sides but I don't have the same number of hydrogens so I need to add some more bubbles of hydrogen gas and I can only add the same bubbles that I already have now I have two four six bubbles of hydrogen gas um, and it is balanced now I need to write this out neatly for the examiner I have N2 just one bubble of that one two three bubbles of H2 and I have one two bubbles of NH3. Balancing equations, working out um, equations from a block of text is an absolutely essential skill that you are going to need right from the very beginning all the way through to the very end of your chemistry career, no matter how long or short that is. So you need to get practiced on this because I can't guarantee anything, but this is going to come up on your exam. If you want more practice to this, you can get loads more examples um, either over on my classroom channel or get my book from my website. There are lots of different ways you can separate out mixtures. For example, distillation, you can use that to separate um, mixtures of liquids that I'd have different boiling points. You can separate off a liquid away from a solid, leaving a solid in there with evaporation. Filtration, you can have your solid staying in the filter paper while your liquid drips through. And fractional distillation, you can use that to separate um, compounds or mixtures out by different sizes and by different boiling points. Before we had our current model of the atom, we had the plum pudding model of the atom, which was a large um, cloud, a large sphere of positive charge with electrons randomly dotted throughout it. A few people did experiments um, which changed the model of the atom and led to the model that we have today. 
Rutherford and Marsden conducted an experiment to show that the model of the atom wasn't quite like what they thought. If the model of the atom was like the plum pudding model, with positive and negative charges evenly distributed, when they fired that alpha particle gun, which is positive at it, you would expect things to bounce back. But that's not what happened. What actually happened is that the majority of things went straight through. A few things went towards it and then got deflected a little bit. And then very, very infrequently, things went towards it and bounced backwards. And this suggested to them that the positive charge wasn't evenly distributed, but was clustered around little centres, which they called the nucleus. At the time of this discovery, they only knew about the positive and the negative things inside an atom, the protons and the electrons, but this didn't really correlate with other data that they had about the weight. So a third thing was discovered by Chadwick, and he proved the existence of neutrons. The periodic table tells you a lot more than you actually think. On the periodic table we have groups, these go down, increasing in number as we go across. And the groups tell us the number of electrons on the outer shell. The periods go across like this, and don't forget period number one. Everyone always forgets period number one because it's tiny and it only has hydrogen and helium in it, but it's really important. Uh, period number two, period number three, period number four, increasing as you go down, and this tells us the number of electron shells. We can use these two pieces of information to work out the electronic configuration of an atom. We can also use it to remind us how many electrons go in each shell. So in the first period there are two elements and in the first shell we can only fit two electrons. In the second period there are eight elements and in the second shell we can only fit eight electrons. In the third period there are eight electrons elements and in the third shell we can only fit eight electrons. The fourth shell you only need to know up to calcium. So if we wanted to draw for example silicon here we can see that is in the third period so silicon is going to have three shells and it is in group number four so it's going to have four electrons on the outer shell. So if we now want you to draw argon, we would do AR in the middle. We would find argon on our periodic table. There it is. It has, it's in period three, so it's going to have three shells. It is in group eight or group zero, they both mean the same thing, so it's going to have eight electrons on outer shell. And it has 18 electrons in total. So we know it has three shells, so we need to draw three circles around it. It does not matter how neat your circles are. The first shell can only hold two electrons, no more than that. The second shell can hold up to eight electrons, but no more than that. Now we have two plus eight, that makes 10 electrons. And then the third shell can hold one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight electrons. Two plus eight plus eight makes 18 electrons in total. Now, if we were to write the electronic configuration of this, we start from the middle and we say there are two electrons on the first shell, eight electrons on the second shell, and eight electrons on the third shell. 
An iron is an atom that has lost or gained electrons. So here are two examples for you, sodium and fluorine. Now sodium has an atomic number of 11, which means it has 11 protons, and that does not change. Now in the atom, the atomic number is also the number of um, electrons. So it has 11 protons, which have a positive charge, 11 electrons, which has a negative charge, and overall 11 plus minus 11 equals zero, no charge. Now sodium has this lonely electron on the outside here, and it doesn't like being a lonely electron, so when it turns into an iron, this lonely electron disappears, it goes away, it goes somewhere else. So now sodium as an iron only has 10 electrons. So it has 11 positive charges, 10 negative charges, 10 plus minus 11, equals a charge of plus one. Fluorine as an atom has an atomic number of nine, which means it has nine protons in the atom and the ion as well. The atom, the atomic number, is also equal to number of electrons, so that equals nine electrons. So it has nine positive charges and nine negative charges. Nine plus minus nine gives us an overall charge of zero. However, in the iron, it's going to have gained this extra electron here. So it actually has 10 electrons. So 9 positive charges, 10 negative charges, giving us an overall charge of minus 1. Now you can either remember how to work it out, or you can remember it from the periodic table. For example, everything in group 1 is going to go on to form plus 1 ions. Everything in group 2 is going to form plus 2 ions. Everything in group 6 is going to form minus 2 ions. And everything in group 7 is going to form minus 1 ions. Metals, which are on the right hand side, are going to form positive ions. And non-metals, which are on the right-hand side, not the right, other right-hand side, oh god, I'm awful with directions, are going to form negative ions. Here you can see our modern periodic table, but it didn't always look like that. The very first periodic table included lots of things on there that were compounds, mixtures, that weren't even elements. It was a bit confused and it didn't have any gaps of things that hadn't been discovered. Mendeleev developed the first proper periodic table. He ordered things by mass. He left gaps for things that had yet to be discovered, for example, gallium and uranium in here, and he was able to predict the properties of the things that hadn't been discovered because he grouped things together in groups of similar properties. Over here on the far right hand side, we have group zero, or it's sometimes marked as group eight. These are the noble gases. These are unreactive because they have a full outer shell. The boiling points of these gases increase as you move down the group. Over on the far left hand side of the periodic table, we have group 1, also known as the alkali metals. These are very, very reactive as they only have one electron in their outer shell, which they are desperate to get rid of. Reactivity increases as you move down the group, so things at the bottom are more reactive than things at the top. Group 7 is also known as the halogens. Elements in group 7 are very reactive. They have 7 electrons on their outer shell. They are generally found as diatomic molecules. For example, fluorine gas is F2, chlorine gas is Cl2, and bromine gas is Br2. Reactivity decreases as you move down the table, so fluorine at the top is more reactive than iodine at the bottom, and melting points and boiling points increase as you move down the table. And more reactive elements or more reactive halogen will displace a less reactive halogen in a reaction. This section is about transition metals and it's only for those people doing chemistry, not combined science. Transition metals are fairly typical metals, so if you think of a property or a use of a metal, then it can generally be applied to a transition metals. For example, the transition metals are hard, they're shiny, and they're good at conducting heat and electricity.
because of these properties. They can be used for things like building bridges, building large structures. They can be used for saucepans because they conduct heat or wires because they conduct electricity. Transition metals can also um, come in lots of different colours. For example, copper is going to be blue, iron 2 green, iron 3 red brown.